you right. And thanks for the last question because I think it's a really good introduction to the second part of the presentation. Uh, it was really nice because with URI we decided to build this up together. Uh, we are not working together, so I mean it's based in Switzerland and based in Italy, but we are actually collaborated in a climate kit project, so we we got to know for other reasons and when we got this invitation from Tip Nature, I think it was really nice because it was also an occasion to jointly work on it, so thanks a lot. Um, the idea is to try to narrow down from the international and the European level to the local level. And as Uri was saying, uh, I believe, so this is a really personal uh, comment, uh, that the, in this sense, I mean, the role that the city and the urban areas and uh, also the region somehow can add and the impact they can have, it's really, really strong. Because in terms of target and achieving really a and improving a greener, uh, let's say, environment. Uh, most of the responsibility and most of the competencies actually are at city level. And this is a, uh, uh, no, yeah. Uh, this is a really good frame to the uh, first thing that I will be presenting. So my presentation will go from the urban agenda. I'm not sure if uh, many of you are familiar with this process. And then at the end, I will go much more at the local level. Uh, somebody knows what the urban agenda process is? The Pact of Amsterdam, maybe, from 2016? No. Great. Um, so, yeah, just to try to give you an overview. Uh, I mean, as you may know, there's no uh, DG on urban matters. So the, you know, the European Commission has many DGs, uh, 28 if I'm not wrong, because it should be one per country. Uh, but among those, uh, there's no DG on urban matters. And actually, urban planning uh, is a competence that is completely, uh, let's say, up on uh, the member states, or in most of the cases, actually, regions and or cities. So it's really complicated, the normative there. Uh, I tried to make some comparative study, but it's not easy at all, because really, each member state uh, legislates that in really different ways. Uh, but there was a certain point, and I think it was also pretty late, because it was 2016, uh, what basically I mean the Commission and the European Union realized is that most of the directive that also URI was presenting before have a strong impact on cities. But the cities has no voice on it. So basically they are just recipients no, of the EU directive, but they cannot say, I mean, they cannot say anything about it, let's say. Uh, so what happened? The, um, the Commission started this process with the Pact of Amsterdam when actually in that moment Netherlands was uh, uh, in the six months of presidency uh, of the European Commission. I don't know if you are familiar a bit with the European uh, policies. So each, basically each six months, uh, one member state has the presidency of the European Commission and this is switching. And each member state has, let's say, its own priority. And the Netherlands had the priority that was really focused on urban matters. So they launched this process. Yeah, this is a definition. Uh, so it's a new working method to ensure maximum utilization of the growth potential of cities, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you can read it in the slide. The main idea from the commission was that cities, together with other stakeholders, mostly coming from the DGs, so with the European Commission, and coming from member states and other, uh, let's say, European networks. So I don't know if you ever heard about ICLE, Eurocities, or CARP, so these big city networks. So the idea was to put together uh, all these stakeholders at the same table to discuss which were the priorities of the cities, which are the priority of the cities. And they came up, yeah, we we'll come back to this later on, because firstly, I think it makes sense to show you this they came up with 14 priority teams. I'm not sure you can read it, but I saw that most of you have the computer, so maybe you have the presentation in front, in front of you. So these are 14 priority teams that cities identified to be really important for them in the following years. You can see there is almost everything there. So there is, I don't know, security, energy, digital transition, urban poverty, inequality, housing. Most of them, of course, are also like some kind of I mean, overlapping no? with the priorities. One of those is the sustainable land use, that actually they changed the name of it after the nature-based solution became a really fancy name, so they call it sustainable land use and nature-based solution. Um, 
And the reason why um, I'm presenting this and I'm involving in that is because this partnership is led by and coordinated by the city of Bologna and then is actually co-coordinated by the city of Bologna and the Ministry for Economic Development in Poland. Uh, you have to think that this is not an Horizon 2020 project. So first of all, there's no money. And this is art. Because you're supposed, uh, I mean, you're not supposed to build infrastructure, for example, as it is in the Horizon 2020, but you are supposed to work quite a lot. You have to develop an action plan and you have to implement that action plan. And you can imagine how difficult and how challenging it is when you don't have any money. Uh, so I, I come back to this slide, this is just to try to, I mean, it's the, it's the slide that you can find on the Futurium platform that I really invite you to go and check. So this Futurium is a platform that the European Commission set up uh, as a tool for all the partnership to disseminate the work and also to collaborate somehow. So it's a kind of collaboration and dissemination tool. And here, I mean, there are the key principles of the urban agenda. So you can see that it's, uh, it, there are a lot of, let's say, transversal topic that is about multi-level governance, uh, integrated approach, sustainable urban development, yeah, United Nations goals again, so it's really related with the SDGs also. There you can see the priority teams, and this is the process, I'm not sure yeah, if you can see it, but this is the process of the Pact of Amsterdam in terms of timing. So they define the partnership, and then they basically make a call, an open call to the city. And they say, okay, who's willing to work on it, considering that it's not paid? So it's a really political engagement. Uh, there's no research in it, so it's really different from Horizon Life or whatever you find product, project you may know. And it's really uh, for the cities to start a discussion among them. So there should be a strong political commitment in it. Uh, you can check what the partnerships, so who's involved and what they are working on in this Futurium platform. And I will now focus on this sustainable land use uh, NMBS platform. Um, all the partnerships are working or on these uh, different pillars. So better regulation, better funding, and better knowledge. So what the commission is asking to the city is basically, um, as, a, yeah, as a European commission, what can we do for you in terms of better regulation, so also what like I was presenting before in terms of European directive and strategies, better funding, so this has also an impact, of course, for example, on Horizon Europe, no? there will be the new funding program from 2020, and uh, better knowledge base and knowledge exchange. And ideally, the, the target of this last one are the Horizon 2020 project. So there's quite a strong link a strong link, sorry, between the urban agenda and Think Nature or the other funding projects. Uh, so who's there um, in our partnership? So as I was saying, Bologna is coordinating it. I'm not uh, representing the city. I'm from the university, but we are kind of giving uh, expert support to the whole partnership. Uh, so the city is coordinating together with the Ministry of Poland. Then there is Antwerp, Cork, Lille, Ageda, Stavanger, Stuttgart, and Zagreb. Uh, this is also a kind of call for invitation. So if you are working within or with some cities that could be interested in joining the process, as I was saying before, this is an open process. So everybody is more than welcome to write us, to say, okay, I would like to work on this, I would like to collaborate on that. Again, there's no money. <laughs> so every time that we see this, I mean, that we say this in this kind of events, there's no much reply from the audience. But it is really interesting. It is really interesting. Then there's member states. There is Poland, Cyprus, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Portugal, and Slovenia. And as I was saying before, there are other stakeholders. So there is uh, the European Commission, uh, in particular DG Region, DG Environment, the JRC, so the Joint Research Center, and the DG Research and Innovation. There is ICLE, the European Investment Bank, Eurocities, uh, INCASO, that is a development group uh, of Catalonia. And then there are some other participants with a, let's say, less important role. That is the European Environment Agency, uh, ISACAR, Netherlands, and Europa. So really a lot of people. Uh, what we did, uh, 
there was a year of quite intense work. We met seven times in a year around like the different places I was mentioning before. And the idea and the objective was to develop this action plan. And the action plan, as I was saying before, is, is referring to the three different things. So better funding, better knowledge, and better regulation. And the idea was to define action that could support the seed in these three pillars in the area of sustainable and user nature-based solution. The priority focus of the partnership were land take and land use. There was quite a lot of confusion in terms of the definition of land take and land use. And there actually, and the directives that are related to this. Uh, brownfield was really, really an odd topic, and brownfield redevelopment for the cities, functional urban areas, and again, into the solution. No? Yeah. So you can actually have a look at the action plan because it's available on Futurium. So you can go there and check which action at the end we decided to, to include there and what we are doing in the, in the implementation phase. So here is the action leader, so who you, you will, I mean, who you could refer to if you would like to contact people from that action. And in the action plan, you can find all the description about the objectives, what we want to do, what we, do, what we want to achieve. I will be speaking here uh, in particular about action six, because this is about local regulation. So there were several actions, but one of those, uh, it's about, yeah, actually EU and local regulation. So the objective of this action are, on the one side, to provide recommendation to the Commission on EU regulation, and on the other side, to understand, and this is a bit what Uri was saying before, to understand to which extent MBS are actually already including in urban plans, so really at a local level. And again, as Uri was saying before, in this case, we notice that we have to refer not just to nature-based solution, but to green infrastructure and ecosystem services because it's a really new terms, so as such, it's really difficult to be found in, in policy documents. And the outcomes that we will deliver to the Commission uh, in March of the next year are a recommendation to the EU Commission on a better integration MBS, so this is exactly what Uri was saying before. And at the local level, the idea is to give an overview of what the city of the partnership are doing on this, and to propose, again, uh, some kind of guidelines on how to better integrate that in local plan. That is quite hard, because what I was saying before, so that the different urban plans in the different member states have different regulation. So I think this will be pretty tricky, but we will try to, yeah, to provide some of those. Uh, when I speak about minimum legal requirement or planning standards, it's clear to everybody what I'm referring to. And somebody try to define it. Define what? Minimum legal requirements for MBS. Like to give an example of what it could be. Uh, for instance, in new buildings, to have at least sixty percent of the rooftop covered by a green roof. That's a minimal requirement. Great. For instance, in the city of Pins, but uh, there are funds available to also give more money if uh, the private investor is willing to cover 100% and the 40% can be covered from an extra budget. And in this sense, is a, it's a recommendation or is a regulation? No, so the, it's compulsory? The 60% is a regulation. The 40% is, of course, a regulation a with uh, funding available for that. Great. So this is an example for buildings, no? For green yeah. buildings. Uh, somebody has uh, an example for, uh, yes? <laughs> From the city of Aachen, for instance, when they are building new parking places, uh, they require at least one tree per hundred square meters. So this is uh, related to, again, construction sites. But it's one three hundred square meter. Yeah. That's the Not three really requirements issues. that's prescribed. But of course, you can have more. What? Another restriction is if there is a new uh, road works taking place, then it's prescribed that the uh, landscape elements have to be integrated into the streetscape. So new tree plantings and the uh, bioswales and new green elements have to be implemented. Great, exactly. So I don't know if somebody else yeah, would like to... There is there's a, a regulation in uh, where I come from that if you build a house, 
can only be 20% of the, the land that you, you, you own, like your, your, yeah, your land. So 80% needs to be basically covered by grass and trees. Yeah, so there, are, there are a lot of examples about this. Uh, but yeah, my question on this would be, uh, do you think that this could help? Not alone. Wow, yes, of course, not at all. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, who said yes, of course? And yeah, can you? Well, we see um, for building permits, it's often the only thing which helps. If it's a legal requirement, people don't get their permit if they don't uh, do this, uh, for example, green roof. Who said not at all? I say not only. Uh, not only. <laughs> not, yeah. not only. It means that's good for uh, achieving the minimum requirements, as it was said, but I think uh, much more important is to have uh, communication and education at every local scale. And for instance, the Viennese uh, example in, in the city of Vienna shows that now they develop the green and open space uh, working uh, strategy, which is already a good document at the city level, but their target is to have a local expert uh, for uh, almost every neighborhood to raise awareness of people why it's important to have green roofs, why it's important to have green walls, because that might be uh, well known for uh, stakeholders at the city's um, department or also for professionals, but uh, it doesn't make its way always to the citizens. However, there is money available every year, 500,000 euros to invest into roofs, walls and open spaces. And uh, there is education needed because it's not a prescribed minimum standard, but it's a possibility what we could do. Thanks. And yeah, somebody else would like to develop on this? I'd just like to say that, um, yeah, I think that if it's a legal requirement, then it should work. But um, in the UK, where we have planning policy, policies can be, um, well, you can, get your, you can get around the policy sometimes. Yeah. Developers do that often. Um, so it needs to be a legal requirement rather than a policy. <laughs> no, it's nice to hear that you're from the UK, so, yeah. I, I thought it was more. Uh, <coughs> southern approach, <laughs> but like, uh, because w w what exists, for example, uh, I think there's a really interesting case in Bologna, they have the same that you were saying before. So in case you, um, let's say, yeah, you comply with an indicator that is about permeability and microclimate in buildings, you are allowed to build 20% more in terms of volume of the building, no? But this is a check that they do at project level. So you approve the project, and then they make a variation to the project. They build it with 20% more and without the greening part. They do the same with you. <laughs> That's nice to know. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, it's also important uh, that the legal requirements, whatever they are, are really strict about, uh, uh, so that they define the quality of the NBS. Because I, I always tell this really stupid story from Pro Finland when, when it was written in their, uh, like, uh, planning documents that they have to have a green roof. So what they ended up having was a uh, tin roof painted green. <laughs> and, uh, and there was no legal way to, to, to get around because Somebody's taking me not something. <laughs> and, another, and another thing is that it doesn't matter how well you specify it in the papers, if you are not ready to have a like punishment or penalty fee, if they don't uh, fulfill the, the, the agreement. So now we have the very first case in Helsinki where somebody at the end of the per building project didn't just have the money to build the green roof on top of the building, but suddenly the money was found when the city put a penalty fee that was high enough to bring a, a lot of negative pressure on the constructor. So you have to add things to this. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but this is an open question. Yeah, yeah. We could use it in a way, for example, uh, the question of water. Uh, if, some, if you use the regular gray system, you pay far more for the water on the, uh, on the city level. 
But if you use the MBS, maybe you should pay less for the water and sewage and so on. Maybe that would be one of the solutions. Yeah, and so like kind of incentives. Positive motivation. Yeah. Uh, not good. just negative, but, but also positive. Great. Maria? Nice. Um, we did kind of the same question. I don't know if some of you was in Paris at the Think Nature Forum. Uh, we did a workshop on this, uh, and these are some of the conclusions uh, that it's, I mean, it's kind of the same of what we, we were discussing today. So there were people that say, yes, we should set compulsory standards such as, uh, I don't know, whatever, kilo, um, sorry, square meter of green area per inhabitant. Yes, if we use measurable green fa factors for projects. Yes, but, that is a bit what you were saying before, not only, no, this is a yes, but. Uh, we have to reverse the way of setting rules. For example, there was a really nice suggestion, in set, instead of setting like mini minimum parking spots per building, you can set a maximum. So in that case, if you set a maximum of parking spots, you will leave much more spaces to green. That was a suggestion actually for somebody coming from Greece. They don't remember yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> you see, I took a note. <laughs> then uh, there was a, uh, also somebody that said no. There was a guy from the United States, maybe it's here, no? Um, that they said that, for example, in the USA, uh, regulation is not working. They really work part with guidelines. He was from New York. They have this guideline for green roof and green walls and whatever, and apparently it was proceeding super well. Yeah. So there's no a correct answer to that question, and there's, I think, like different approaches could work differently yeah. in different places also. Uh, and if not, and this is a bit what you were referring also to before, so if not, what we can do now to boost this? And there was a lot about raising awareness, so it's what you were saying before about education. Uh, there was a lot about like starting with a strategy, so with a more strategic level instead of a regulation level. Uh, and yeah, and there was also something more about technology, too. so to try to use more models and like let's say IT tools to really understand the impact and to do it more carefully. Um, the main talks, let's say, that came out from that was, uh, there were a lot of examples in that case, that's the one you were proposing now. I think these means are in some public deliverables, maybe your goes. it's not here. Yeah, maybe these are no, in some deliverables of Think Nature also, but there is a summary of those, uh, of that uh, workshop. You can find uh, all these outcomes in uh, deliverable 4.4. 4.4? Yes. Great. So I won't, I mean, I won't go really much longer into this, uh, but yeah, so it's really, it's really interesting. I mean, it's definitely an open question, uh, but I do believe, I mean, there's much to do in any case. Uh, so yeah, it's really interesting to have a look at it. Uh, I will try to give you now some example, that's the one that you were saying now. Uh, I, I define it top down because part of the presentation uh, also refer somehow to the governance scheme. So these are kind of top-down approach, so regulation, normative, and whatever, and then we will see a couple of bottom-up, so more like participatory process to boost those. I will start, I mean, this is really fast. I don't want to, uh, yeah, to bother you with this because it's something that you can find uh, yeah, in any kind of document, let's say, and for a lot of cities. But from the partnership, so from the Urban Agenda partnership, we have analyzed so far Bologna and Zagreb. Uh, it's uh, what, what you were saying before about the building urban code. So there's something similar, that there is this index about uh, soil permeability and microclimate, so that the new developer has to include uh, in the project, and it's what I was referring before, so that there's no monitoring of that. Uh, but it's interesting that there is, uh, in Italy, uh, there is a national law that somehow uh, give to the region uh, the, the right to, yeah, to make law about urban planning and then the region define guidelines for the city to develop their urban plans. And the region where uh, Bologna is, is Emilia Romagna, they just released the new urban planning law. Um, and it's, um, yeah, I mean, it has a lot of good stuff and bad stuff, let's say, but it's kind of working in the direction of what uh, yeah, the lady there, that I yeah, don't know the name, was referring before. So they are trying to switch from a quantitative to a qualitative point of view. 
So before, uh, and this is true for all Italy, uh, let's say for public services, there was uh, a quantitative amount, so it was 30 square meter, and in uh, Emilia Romagna was 17 of which should be uh, green spaces in the new construction. But now, also because of the land use regulation, so that you are not allowed to build more than 3% of the city uh, um, area, they are switching to a more qualitative way. So they're not telling you anymore how many square meter you have to develop, but which kind of performances uh, that area should provide. So they are slowly moving in the direction of quality, let's say. Uh, Zagreb, they are kind of doing the same, let's say, with the spatial plan of the city. In yeah, in favor of me. <laughs> Are you from Zagreb? Yeah. Okay. That's what Nicola told me. It's from the Urban Planning Department. <laughs> so I trust him. Uh, then, yeah, these are two examples about green roofs, so it's pretty similar to what you were mentioning before. I won't go, yeah, like, far, like really long into this, so it's London and Toronto. Apparently, they were really successful in both of the cases, so the, the area of the green roof after the the regulation increased quite a lot. And a, a, a really nice example uh, that is maybe similar to what you were mentioning of uh, Vienna uh, is the um, Bristol Park and Green Space Strategy because they developed this green space standard that again is not just quantity but is quality and distance. So they managed to include in just one standard the three different, uh, let's say, characteristics that, uh, in this case, a new green area should have. So a level of quality, a level of distance, so how far and accessible is the place from the people that live in the area, and a level of quantity, so a minimum, no, a minimum standard again. Um, here, I'm trying to jump from the, like, really, uh, let's say, detailed regulation and detailed uh, yeah, norms that the city are, uh, are including in their plans, in their code or whatever, to a more strategic vision. So what we were working on um, in my research group uh, was about two case studies. So one is Bologna and one is Barcelona. Um, and the idea in there was to try to understand which was the integration of MBS and ecosystem services in a much more comprehensive policy document. And this is the case of Bologna. I'm not sure you can yeah, see it, but again. So we considered greening policy, climate policies, and urban planning documents. And what we tried to do was to understand, first of all, if there is a connection among the different documents in terms of greening. Uh, if there is this connection, how is regulating and how is monitored? Uh, and which could be the impact of this connection? Because we believe, uh, again, I believe uh, that at city level, if you don't have connection and communication among the different departments, there's definitely no way they're going to do anything. And this is what, uh, in several interviews with city officers, this is what they say to you every time. We are not speaking with the greening people. We are not speaking with the ed people. We're not speaking, and I mean, they are in the same building. But still, there's really fragmented uh, scenario, let's say, and this is really clear, for example, in Bologna. So they're working on a new city master plan, so there's still hope that it will be better. Uh, but so far, these documents are pretty single documents. So people can really get lost in what they have to do in reference to one document. For example, the climate adaptation plan, uh, it's a really great document. Uh, I mean, it was the first in Italy, I think it was one of the first in Europe, They it was developed within a life project, and I think you, you also won some prizes for you, whatever best climate adaptation plan. Uh, but it's really a strategic document, and it's not clear how they're going to implement it. And this is clear because there's no almost, I mean, there are some links, but there's almost no link with all the urban planning documents that are actually setting the standards and the regulation. Uh, they are developing now the new city master plan and they're really working now on this integration. So I think like all the cities are slowly moving into a more, uh, yeah, let's say collaborative direction. Uh, Barcelona is a really good case on the other side. 
Um, I don't know if you had the, the chance to have a look at their climate plan. It was released last year. Uh, it was a really long process. Uh, of course, in this sense, the policy they got, so the political movement, let's say, that was there, so this, the city in Barcelona, so this particip participatory platform uh, where the citizens were really involved by the Ada Colau, so the previous mayor of Barcelona. Uh, this Black Lima has, uh, I think it's 22 actions, most of them relate with green, I mean a lot of them relate with green, and there's a really explicit target, so they are aiming to have before 2030, if I'm not wrong, one square meter uh, of green uh, per people, so one more square meter uh, per inhabitant. I'm not sure they're going to achieve it because Barcelona is one of the most compact cities in Europe, but I mean, they are working on that direction. And it's really nice to see how this is linked to all the other documents. So they have these trees for life, so they have a plan for trees, a master plan for trees, uh, that is really uh, connected to that, for example, in terms of species, so adapted species to climate change, uh, adapted species to draft, I mean, it's a really, yeah, water is really an issue there. They have a green uh, infrastructure and biodiversity strategy that is also defining several, uh, several action. And the way they're uh, putting all this together, uh, it's really interesting because they will have a resilience strategy at the beginning of next year where they're trying to put all this together, together with the social part. So they will be speaking a lot about housing. They will be speaking a lot about gender. So I don't really agree that gender is not uh, I mean, coming back to the sustainable development goals, uh, there's a lot to do about gender inequality in parks and in access in, uh, in green areas. Because it's not, I mean, it's not the same, the, the perceived uh, sense of, let's say, security that many women have in parks. So there's a lot to do in terms of accessibility to green areas. And they're also working in that direction. Mm. This is a yeah, kind of overview uh, that we try to lead. Uh, so I'm not sure how, how much is clear, but I think that like after the, the presentation you had in these days, uh, maybe we can discuss this a bit. So the idea here was to try to put together the different uh, terms and terminology. Because we are speaking sometime when we speak about policy, we are speaking about ecosystem services, green infrastructure, nature-based solution, as they were the same thing. They are not. But this is hard sometimes to communicate to the policy makers. So we try to make this scheme uh, that is definitely not, uh, how do you say that? I mean, it's, it's a point discussion, so we, we can discuss about it. Uh, the idea in there, like the line that you see there, is like impact, phase, uh, and scale. So we are, of course, speaking about uh, a plan and a project. So impact of the project, phase, and scale. The idea is that moving from single to multiple impact, uh, and moving from really small case, so buildings, uh, to really large uh, scale projects, so city or even landscape, and moving from the different phase of the project implementation, uh, we, we cannot use the same terms. So in this case, and I know that in Think, in Think Nature handbook, you didn't use this terminology, and I'm sorry, but it is before the handbook. Uh, so the hybrid MBS are, uh, in this case, are referring mostly to what we were saying before, the green roof, uh, green walls, so these like more engineering and greening buildings part. So they are definitely small scale in most of the cases. And they also have maybe not single, but not like multiple impact. They don't have like in most of the cases social impact. You cannot speak about uh, a green wall and say that he has a social cohesion impact. While if you move to larger, so urban parks, of course they have multiple impact. And the idea, I mean, the difference in this is like when you move to larger scale, you, you can speak about ecosystem-based MBS or a green infrastructure in this sense. And the ecosystem services is a kind of an overreaching framework that should regulate and monitor all this project implementation. And I think in this case is what Barcelona was really successful to do. So before uh, the development of several policies, what they did was an analysis of the supply and demand of ecosystem services uh, today and like in, uh, in the future, so with some projection. 
and based on that, they develop which kind of project they need in the city. And those projects can be monitored with the same system, so using the ecosystem services indicators. I'm not sure if it's clear. Please, uh, yeah, raise your, yeah. Um, I'm thinking about green infrastructure that it should reach from small to large, not only start to the medium, because from my point of view, green infrastructure is, of course, rather a city or a landscape scale thing because it's about network and connections and having a system but it consists of uh, small elements as well and they not always have to be hybrid uh, nature-based solutions because they can be also um, small green patches, small green spaces within the uh, city fabric which all together create the system so it's a uh, it's just a matter of looking at the scale because to me, green infrastructure starts at the small and goes to the large. Yeah, that it could make sense, yes. The, I think the reason why we included it there was, uh, again, much more in regards to policy. So if you look at policy, when they speak about green infrastructure, in most of the cases, they don't even speak at city level. I mean, now they're starting, uh, but I mean, most of the reference till 2010, if you refer to green infrastructure, are linked to Natura 2000 sites and networks. So it's, I mean, it was, maybe it's changing, it's true. But you, you talked about uh, EU level policies, right? Also like regional policies. Okay, because this, if I look at city policies, which I have knowledge of, when it comes to green infrastructure, they pretty much go to the plot level sometimes. For yeah. instance, the Vienna green infrastructure strategy, the, as the green and open space factor, which uh, also evaluates uh, how much of the surface has to be permeable or green, green. So it talks about not only hybrid nature-based solutions, but also about surfaces, permeable, seal, uh, green, open. And this is in the green infrastructure strategy. That's a, uh, it's called green and open space. Uh, okay. Um, uh, a concept. Uh, professional concept or technical concept for green and open spaces. Yeah, yeah I mean, it could be. Somebody has uh, some thoughts on it. Yes. I think, I think it's a bit of an issue, actually, and um, it was a question that I really wanted to answer whilst I was here at the summer school. What was the difference between green infrastructure? Sorry, can you speak a bit loud? Sorry. Because it started to make noise the laptop, but yeah. I cannot hear anything. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to find out what the definition was of green infrastructure and nature-based solutions and why they were different because um, having come from an urban, a more conventional urban planning background, um, nature-based solutions is problematic as a term because it sounds fluffy and a lot of practitioners in my experience are not interested, but green infrastructure seems to catch people's attention more in my experience. Um, so I found that Green infrastructure has been used more often in the city where I am, but as a general term to also include nature-based solutions as well. I mean, I can tell you how I see it, but it's definitely yeah. not uh, whatever. Uh, I think that the term nature-based solution and the way that is uh, now, let's say, the way that was introduced from the Commission is like that it's really related with challenges that green infrastructure was not. So green infrastructure started, as I was saying before, as this Natura 2000 connection area. So you really have to, it's true that now it's included also at city level and for a smaller case, but when it started, it was really to create this green infrastructure that was able to create corridors for species. That was the beginning. Nature-based solution is much more related with the challenges. So as a city, you should be able to define your challenges and think for each challenges how can nature be a solution? So you have a social challenge before you couldn't think at all about green infrastructure for that. But now you can think, okay, maybe if I do a park, an inclusive park, blah, 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 this could have social cohesion. So it's really, I think, a switching in the, in the mentality. So at the end, at the project level, they are, of course, the same thing. So if you do a green roof, I agree with you that it could be, I mean, it's part of the green infrastructure. But the idea that you are solving a problem with nature 
it stands litter. But yeah, maybe pink nature people can can also provide well, their... I think the challenge then is, is um, for us is to explain to practitioners and get the buy-in yeah. from them. The idea is maybe you don't, <laughs> you don't have to explain them, yeah. but just try to understand how to go through it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. I, I don't know what time it is. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to me, it's just a matter of uh, terminology. It depends pretty much on the cultural concept also. For instance, I uh, have been doing some research on planning and implementation of green infrastructure in Austrian cities. And uh, they say they don't work with these new terms at all. They uh, stick to the conventional old terms like green spaces, green uh, open spaces, green space factor. And they have their conventional words and uh, they are they get confused when it comes to green infrastructure because uh, they some some of them look for the technical element in it because of the term infrastructure. The others think about it as something large scale and not such a small scale. So this is always dependent on the context, I think. But nature-based solution is, a, for me, more action-oriented, while this green infrastructure is more strategy, system, concept-oriented. So to think about the city landscape and its green spaces and green networks as a concept, as a, as a strategy, and nature-based solutions is to look at the existing problems and maybe legs of the system and how to fill it in. So that's talking about the same thing from different perspectives. Yeah. So also nature-based solutions, I think, has a definition. Who's speaking? Please. <laughs> 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 I think nature-based solutions, as at least that is definition, it's more social and uh, economic oriented, and I, I don't think that green uh, infrastructures, at least the the pure definition, of course, in practice is different, but the pure definition is not so connected with the social and uh, the economic part, and also. Well, in some aspect, I, I believe that nature-based solutions only exists also because green infrastructure as a concept didn't embed really well on the urban planning. Could be. No, I agree with you that that's, so, that's also what I was telling you before. So in the terms green infrastructure, there was not social and economic, I mean, maybe they can but the social part was nothing to do to it. And I, actually, this is also really controversial. I mean, I know that there are several people that are working on research say that like NATO-based solution is a really neoliberal term that is actually pushing towards a recognition of nature as an economic driver. So, I mean, there are a lot of discussion, but this is really like, I think, academic, like uh, whatever talks. So that's the reason why I say, like, when you're speaking with planners, when you're speaking with the city, it's not really important, of course, the terms we use. But what you were referring to about Vienna, I think it's important, even if they want to keep the same language that they were, there should be a mind changing in what those terms and those solutions can provide to the city. Because before, the greening was just, I don't know, I'm thinking about uh, urban planning in Italy, so greening was like children uh, playground, Sport stuff and that's it. And I mean, there was not really, you know, attention on the species, attention on what it could provide in terms of health, well-being, and whatever. So as soon as you, I mean, as soon as the city is aware of what that green space index or whatever is able to provide, we don't have an issue with the with the definition of the terms. Again, I believe. Okay. The, the, the right part would like to say something. <laughs> it's really focused on, on this side. There is somebody who would like to add something. The right part from your perspective. Yeah, from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as bottom up, I won't go, uh, I mean, deep into this, but it's just to, I think, I mean, this is a really nice example. And yeah, I kind of have a, I mean, an emotional link to it because I participate in one of those labs, so that's the reason also why I wanted to, to present it. 
Um, there is uh, an initiative from the city of Bologna that is called participatory budgeting. Maybe it's also common in other cities. So the idea is that there is a part of the budget of the city that is not the city itself deciding what they want to do with that, but that budget is uh, divided among the neighborhoods and through a participatory process, uh, people from the neighborhood work on a project that will be funded. So the idea is like that there are these, uh, they call it uh, neighborhood labs, that they go on for one year, so you meet with all the people from, I mean all, the people that would like to join from your neighborhoods, uh, and each neighborhood proposed like six or seven projects, so there are different group working, and it's really nice because then there is an open voting session, so all the residents in the city can go on the website or like in some, I don't know, table around the city, and they can vote the project that they would like to see realized for their, um, for their neighborhood. And it's really nice because the, I mean, in the participatory budget thing, there was no reference to green public spaces. So the idea was just that the city was giving money for, let's say, the regeneration of, of some public spaces, but it could be building, it could be art center, it could be whatever. But it was really nice because like more than 80% of the projects that were presented in the last three years are about green space regeneration. So I think this really, like, I mean, it's, it was really a me direct message to the city council that there was that need in the city and the citizens had that need. And it's really nice because uh, it's really a participatory process, just, I mean, not just in the development, but also in the implementation phase. So the people that wrote the project and that developed the project together with the city then are responsible for co-implementing and co-monitoring it, and also co-managing. So this is, of course, of great value also for the city, because that the management of the green areas then is also upon the citizens that propose the project. And I mean, you can go and check, it's called, uh, I don't remember, but I can send you the link. And it's, yeah, I think it's a really nice project. And the same that I was mentioning before, uh, the climate plan in Barcelona was really also, uh, I mean, was not totally bottom up, of course, because I mean, there were several targets that the city itself wanted to, to develop and include there. But there were a lot of meetings with the citizens that also had, I mean, yeah, got their voice in the process. There's no bundle in Bologna, right? That the, the, the is having participatory no. budget. No, I think there are so several cities with the participatory budgeting. It's really great to see this. Yeah, I don't know if you know any example. Uh, of another city? Or yeah. Like, I spoke to three cities in Italy and they all had, had it, so it's really good. <laughs> Yeah, now sorry. From Nitra, from Slovakia, in the participatory budget. I think the idea is nice, but uh, I miss a bit uh, a coordinated power over it. It's like uh, there, there should be some kind of coordination so that it goes in the strategic direction, not just uh, on this pop up uh, phase. And the other thing is also the voting system is not always the most transparent one, I would say, because it depends also on how, uh, not, not on how the project would help the city, but how many friends you have. I mean, if you got a lot of project, friends so. in the neighborhoods, you got yeah. the project, and yeah. you feel fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, neighborhoods would be happy. No, I mean, it's true, but yeah, I don't know the other cases. In the case of Bologna, the budget is not that big. I mean, they have 300,000 per year, they're all the neighborhood, so they are really the regeneration project of like really small areas. And I think it's much more to get an engagement and to get a, a kind of reply than from, yeah, for the project itself somehow. But I mean, it's working really well. People are really enthusiastic and I think that, I mean, to me, the most interesting thing was to see so many different generations. So there were people of, I don't know, 18 years and people of 70. And in most of these uh, like participatory stuff, at least in Italy, mostly it's just elderly people that go there. I don't know why. But in this case, there were a lot of young and really young people also involved. And the collaboration is really funny <laughs> among the different people. Um, so to close, and I think it's time. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just some kind of 
talks. Um, so normative regulation can be can be really strong tool to support the further implementation, but there is a need to change the approach and the mentality within cities. Uh, that this regulation against guidelines, so in some cases and in some culture, guidelines can actually work better than regulation. Uh, and this is a point that I think it's really important. Uh, in a, I mean, in some of really good plan and really good strategy that you look at them and it's like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, when there's no a strong monitoring plan, a strong monitoring strategy, I mean, those strategy could be totally ineffective. So it's really important to keep that tension on the implementation of the strategy itself. And yeah, like these innovative, let's say, governance and participatory methods, uh, yeah, I believe really can also boost the concept of MBS, mostly with the, with the social part, maybe. So it's not really in a strategic and, uh, or environmental level, let's say. But it's clear that there is an increasing request for greener and healthier city from the citizens. And maybe, yeah, city should start listening. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Maybe I, I mentioned one example for financing and issue based solutions. Is it, you are from UK, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyone from UK? Okay. So we were in Manchester and there's an interesting thing how they finance uh, city parks. So uh, the local residents who are living in the vicinity of parks, they pay uh, a percentage of the rent which goes directly to municipality to a special budget which they use for financing and maintenance of parks. It's very interesting. I'm not sure if it works in other countries as well, uh, but if it's in Manchester maybe other UK cities are using the same approach. Pine Dover uh, also has like a compensation scheme uh, that works like that. So new buildings, if they cannot have the minimum uh, green space, they need to pay uh, yeah. an extra fee to the compensation, green compensation scheme that is basically only used in uh, green infrastructures in the city. Yeah. But then they can choose where they're going to use that budget, right? Yes. So it's maybe more flexible in that terms. But this is really focusing on one uh, part. Uh, we've seen the, in the area one where yeah. people can really have access. So yeah. it's very targeted. So. Yeah, and I have to say that this is a policy that is really vastly implemented in the US. And it's a, a, a source for gentrification. So it's basically how they keep people out. They start to create a special taxation district. And this can be completely problematic for you know, social cohesion and other communities. Because so, of gentrification. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it's, it's a way to keep people out. Yeah. And you, you raise the real estate prices, and yeah. it's going to be completely devastating for communities. Do you think it's increases the uh, rates significantly? Uh, yes, yeah. significantly. But this, it's is, a very this small is an American percent. issue. It, yeah. It's not applicable to Europe because in the US, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but like if your neighbor has a renovation, your real estate tax increases because your neighbor has a more beautiful building. So basically when you have like a neighborhood of like black people, once one person sells one building to someone who can invest a lot, Everybody's out because nobody can no longer pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, yeah. uh, it can be very problematic, but this is a completely different in society. Yeah. In Manchester, they said it's working really well. Yeah, it's I'm not sure if it's context specific, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.